the Alex of what Smith, the three sixty or the E sixty no. of okay. No, well, I've been pretty busy. I've been working and fucking trying to move. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel you. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we can go ahead and get started then. Um, I'm gonna clap my hands to do that the same thing I've been doing. All right. <laughs> All right, ladies and gents, welcome back to episode four of the Border Wars podcast. We got Smitty Mouse. Episode Mouse, four. Four. The big four. <laughs> Smitty and Sawyer here once again, coming at you on a two Monday evening. God, the days are just running together, man. Mm-hmm. Um, another week of stay-at-home orders. Every day feels like the same, but, you know, breaking it up with the podcast and new shit on Netflix. I've been really cranking through this show called uh, Outer Banks on Netflix. If you guys haven't watched it, I highly recommend to check it out. It is yeah, trash. Yeah, you, you guys are talking about the Outer Banks. Is it? I mean, you said it's trash, but what's... Uh, What's it all about? I mean, I know that I, I watched the preview because I've had a lot of people say, like, watch the Outer Banks. And, yeah. um, you know, and I watched the uh, trailer and it was kind of like kids that live in Florida or the bayou, if you will. And they I live on a in, boat. And... I think they're in South Carolina and there's like it's like a class like class like warfare between like the rich kids on the island and the poor kids on the island and like but in the midst of all that there's a treasure map that this kid's dad left him to find and like it's dude it is so bad but it's so good it's like a soap opera but like they made into like a like they tried to make a soap opera version of ozarks but with teenagers it's wild but uh other stuff to watch this week um, definitely had some stuff that hit close to home this week. On Friday, ESPN E60 aired Project 11, which, uh, as for the people that don't know, was a documentary uh, on the injury and recovery of former uh, Pro Bowl quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, Alex Smith. Um, so we're going to get into our initial thoughts on that. Um, Smitty, you watched the uh, the documentary. What were your thoughts uh after seeing uh, Project 11 and kind of the battle scars that Alex Smith is, is bearing now and everything that he went through. Uh, yeah, I think that um, this is something that I was looking forward to just because, um, you know, I think Alex Smith meant more to the Chiefs organization than, than people want to give him credit for. Um, you know, watching it was, was kind of very humbling for him. Um, he's a good dude. I mean, he's a good person. I mean, whether you like him or not, whether he won or lost you a game, um, I think at the end of the day that he was a good person, you know, um, you don't see a lot of athletes nowadays that you really truly want to root for, um, based off of who they are as a person. And I think, uh, Alex Smith was kind of that type of person that you wanted him to be better than what he performed and with that being said is that um you know he was a great quarterback because the chiefs have struggled to have a quarterback that has performed the way that alex smith has and um you you wanted him to do well and i think um the problem was is that they went with alex smith and or Alex Smith, uh, Pat Mahomes, and um, you wanted Alex to be successful. I mean, he's the person that you model, that you want to be a, a, a role model for your city. For your city. And um, I think he was that person, but he just he just didn't really get that chance. I mean, he, he had that chance, but um, I, I don't know. I mean – you see what I'm saying, I guess. It, yeah. It, well, it's – it's Alex Smith is one of my favorite athletes in my lifetime in Kansas City because you look at where this franchise was a decade ago. Um, 
You know, we were coming off of losing season after losing season, the Matt Castle debacle that that became. You had the uh, the Joven Belcher situation. Um, this the, the the franchise, the organization was in disarray, and you bring in Andy Reid. And he obviously was instrumental and huge part of that. But another big part of that was us getting stability at the quarterback position. Alex Smith went to the playoffs four out of five times with the Chiefs. He led the league in passer rating his last year with the Chiefs, passed for over 4,000 yards, was efficient, made plays when we needed big plays. And I think a lot of people, you know, want to call him check down Charlie or, or whatever that is. Um, and they look at his game and the things that Alex didn't do, but they forget about all the things that he was capable of doing and all the success he had with the organization. I mean, we've won the division five years in a row, and only two of those were were Mahomes leading the charge. The other three were Alex Smith at the helm. And I think you're right. I think every Chiefs fan, when Alex Smith left, they were excited for the opportunity and the prospect of Mahomes starting. But I don't think a single Chiefs fan didn't also say at the same time, man, I really hope he's successful in Washington. Because the guy has earned as much. Um, I remember that 2012 season, uh, 2012, 2013 season, when he was still with the 49ers before he came to Kansas City. And he was knocked out with that concussion. And at the time, I was working as a game day intern for the St. Louis Rams. And that first game back was at St. Louis, Niners versus the Rams, in the Edward Jones Dome. And part of my responsibilities were being on the sideline and helping escort, like, the, you know, the VIPs to their section. And that day it happened to be Isaac Bruce and his family, which was really cool, and we can save that for another podcast. But it was the first time that Alex Smith had been ruled medically cleared after his concussion to start. And Kaepernick still got the nod at QB. And to see Alex Smith warming up, and you could just tell, like, I saw him walk through the tunnel. Like, just the guy is a competitor, and he wanted to be out there. But at the same time, he's committed to doing whatever it takes for a team to win. And so to see what happened, you know, in 2018 to him with that injury, it was so tragic. But we really didn't get the insight on what exactly was going on. We heard the stories of, you know, infection and life-threatening, you know, possible, you know, amputation, all that stuff. But we didn't really get to see how grueling that process was. So to get that insight, um, it really – I already loved Alex Smith and was great, so grateful and appreciative of what he did for the organization while he was here. But I had a newfound respect for him, even more so after seeing, seeing that documentary. It was, it was really incredible um, what he went through. Yeah, yeah I got a, you got a pretty notorious tweet from uh, <laughs> the Alex Smith trade, right? <laughs> I just well, said Kansas City fans, He, was, I, all I said was he was the most successful quarterback in our lifetime as a chief. I mean, really, you can say like, oh, Joe Montana was the most accomplished, but Joe Montana only led us to, you know, one playoff appearance in an AFC championship appearance. Alex Smith led us to force – four straight postseasons, three division titles. I mean, think of another quarterback that was that successful in the regular season in our lifetime. There, there isn't one. Trent Green couldn't stay Trent healthy. Green. Trent Green wasn't healthy long enough to do it. We were only in the playoffs. I was there when Brissett uh, hit him late hit on his helmet. That was uh, – yeah, I'm just kidding. It was the Bengals, but it wasn't him. I just yeah. imagine him as a really old player and like to joke around and it was him. What was yeah. how's his last name pronounced? Burfisa, Burfisa, whatever. Fuck it. It wasn't perfect, but uh, <laughs> I know had, had a had 2003 as a postseason appearance. You know, with the Chiefs, Alex Smith had four. And you know, you think and you look at the the times that we lost in the postseason, um, whether it was to the Colts the year that they had the in 2014 when they had that massive comeback. That wasn't Alex Smith's fault. That was the defense. You look yeah. at some of those the losses to the Titans. Yeah, we didn't really score a lot in the second half, but you know we kind of got boned in those situations. And against the Steelers, that lost. Alex Smith led us to a, a game tying touchdown that was predicated on a two point conversion being 
being converted and he completed the two point conversion to Dwayne or to um, Demetrius Harris that was called back for a hold, which was really more of a flop by James Harrison. So you can look at his lack of success in the postseason. It's not attributed necessarily to his performance. It was mainly attributed to external factors around the team. And I know the responsibilities on the quarterback to rally the team and, and lead them to victory. But in a lot of those circumstances, it was the guys around him. It was the pieces around him that didn't give him an opportunity to win. Smitty? Tommy, well, if it was – can I ask one question, Tommy? Yeah. If it was your decision when we traded Alex Smith, would you have would you have traded him away or would you have kept him? I mean, I, mean, I had to say – Chime in real quick. I think, yeah, go ahead. I think the easy, I think the easy, the easy answer to that, you know, is well, we had Pat Mahomes. So um, I think the easy answer to that question was yes, you would trade him away. But um, let's let's just backtrack a little bit and and let's look at Alex Smith. And Alex Smith was drafted by by the San Francisco 49ers, arguably the worst team at the time. And within a few years, he had him playing in the playoffs. Um, I don't think there's any question that Alex Smith was arguably at least a top 10 quarterback uh, in the league at the time um, and at the time that he came to the Chiefs. He just got dealt. I mean, you look this this whole documentary was about the the card that he was dealt. And unfortunately, the card that he was dealt was just a bad hand because, um, you know, he gets a concussion in San Francisco and then. Here comes Colin Kaepernick, and with, with, with one game, one game, uh, Kaepernick just just goes off, and Alex Smith loses his his starting role, um, and then he gets traded to the Chiefs. He he was dealt nothing but bad hands through his entire career, and I think that that's what this whole documentary gets at is that. He can be a successful quarterback. He can be a good quarterback. He's not the quarterback that's going to drop down and, and and drop bombs, but he's the quarterback that is not going to lose you games. I think that was kind of the biggest uh, conundrum with him in Kansas City was that he wasn't going to – he didn't advance Kansas – he got a, he got Kansas City to the, net, to the playoffs, but he was not – going to advance us to the AFC or yeah, the AFC championship round. He got us to the AFC uh, divisional round, but he could just never get over that hump. Um, And I I think that's where we need to uh, give him more credit is because he got us into a position where we felt comfortable being in the playoffs. Um, And I think that's where he really handed it off the torch, if you will, to Pat Mahomes. He he really showed Pat Mahomes how to win the game. Um, it's not it's not throwing, you know, fifty yard bombs on the field, which Pat Mahomes can do. But that's where he taught Patrick Mahomes how to be a student of the game. Um, it's not about just dropping back and and, and throwing fifty yard bombs to Tyree Hill or, or Travis Kelsey or or whoever. It's knowing how to read the defense. Um, see what the defense is giving you and and, and taking what they're giving you, yeah. if you will. And at the time of his injury right. in, I, in, in Washington, the Washington Redskins were tied for the division lead. I mean, so he was winning in Washington, too. I mean, everywhere he's gone, he's won. Um, right. So, And it's just such a devastating setback because the reality is you saw the damage to his leg. He says, yeah, you know, I think I want to return to football, possibly I'm not ruling it out. I think that's him just leaving the door open. But I, th- I don't think there's a single chance that he ever suits it up again. And it's sad because I think he had three or four good seasons left. Um, but, man, to get into more of the specifics of the documentary, the amount of pain and suffering he had to endure with that in- injury, basically being on the brink of death, he was septic. He had to have like 30, 40 percent of his leg removed. I mean, the tissue and the bone and the muscle that was infected. I mean, it was literally it was like the crazy thing was that he had to go to San Antonio and recover at a medical facility or a military medical facility because the damage that had been done after all the surgeries to remove the infected tissue amounted to that of like a military trauma injury. 
and that was just the, that was the craziest part for me. No, I think I think you're uh, yeah really right on that. Um, you know, that tells you the type of person that uh, Alex Smith was is that how how much of a competitor he was is that um, he truly risked his life to try to play again. Um, and I think that is the type of he plays quarterback. That's the, that's, that's the given position of, of the popular position. But, um, you know, when you see somebody like Alex Smith, that is, that is coming to a crossroad of, all right, we're going to, the easy way out is to cut off your leg. The hard way out is we're going to keep your leg. We're going to remove basically the entire muscle fibers, all that stuff from your leg and we're gonna we're gonna take them from your thigh and and, and put it put that to your leg um, for you to at least even be able to walk again. Um, and he chose that route because that's how competitive he was um, and is still this, to this day. Um, I think he could still play quarterback today. Um, watching him watching this entire documentary, but I don't think that he's going to be a starting quarterback. Um, for the NFL, I think that if, if it were me, I would have gone the same route as Alex Smith. But knowing that um, that I'm never going to be able to compete again the way that he competed, um, I think the best route for Alex Smith right now is to be. I, I think he could be a great coach. Honestly, yeah, I, I, I think if if I were the Chiefs and if I were the Chiefs, and I, I, I don't know who the, the quarterback coach is for the Chiefs, but um, uh, if I'm the Chiefs, if I'm Andy Reid, I, I'm calling Alex Smith and I'm saying, hey, I'm paying you whatever you want to do, whatever you want um, to be a quarterback's coach for the Chiefs. And if I'm Alex Smith, I'm taking that deal because I think that's going to project him into being a coach. I think Alex Smith could be a great coach. I think there is – the point in that that documentary that um, Pat Mahomes even says that I attribute Pat Mahomes attributes his game to Alex Smith. Um, Alex uh, Alex Smith showed Pat Mahomes how to read defenses, which I think that was probably Alex Smith's best part of his game. He's not going to drop bombs on you. He's not going to roll out to the left. But he can scramble. Um, he knows how to read defenses, and I think that really progressed Pat Mahomes to what we see today. Yeah, and, and I think I think what his teammates you saw the hype on Twitter of like Tyreek and you know Travis Kelsey and the other guys that were part of that offense, basically saying like this is a must watch. You guys got to see this guy and what he went through. And I think all those guys that he played with, they, they give him the guys in the locker room, give him way more credit for putting us on this path to success that we're on now. than the general Kansas city fan does because they saw the work. They saw the kind of culture that he helped cultivate there with Veach and with Andy Reed and, and, and instilled that ethic in Patrick Mahomes and, I think I think we should give him a Super Bowl ring. I mean, he was that instrumental in getting us to where we are today. Because if you look at the pieces of that team uh, in 2017, a, a lot of those guys are still there. And the influence of Alex Smith, they can't speak highly enough about him. So, yeah, I, I would love him to rejoin the organization in some capacity. That would be fantastic. Storybook ending to you know what was an unfortunate end to his career in Kansas City, but one that I think a lot of people will look back fondly on. I'm I'm not a big person. Um, I, I'm not a. I, I I don't like these. Um, let's bring back Dwayne Bow. Let's bring back uh, Jamal Charles for a day to sign one day contract for for these people to. That's that's not me. I I don't like that. But I understand it at the same point. But I would make a an extreme exception to bringing Alex Smith back. Like I I. I truly believe that Alex Smith does deserve a Super Bowl ring just because of all the um, all the things that he's come across. Um, I'm not like I said, I'm not a big person on, on, on doing that, but 
I would make an exception for Alex Smith just because, like I said, I think that he was – I think it was Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco with the Broncos when they brought in um, – uh, what's his face uh, um, from Missouri? You know, Sawyer. Drew Locke. Drew Locke. Drew Locke. So, so Flacco's like, I, I'm not about like training him. That that is so wrong with. with Does that with confirm? Flacco. Listen, but, but listen Joe Flacco. I love, I love Alex Smith, but okay. First of all, back to the we had Mahomes. So, so when I asked Tommy if we should trade Alex Smith, Mike said, "Well, we have Mahomes, so yeah." But like we, I mean, listen, coaches and teams. You know, they evaluate players in practice, and I'm sure they knew he was good, but a lot of that is unknown until you put someone in a game. Um, and so that's a bit of a risk. Like, that's a that's a hard trade to make. Um, and then It was a huge gamble so, at the time, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I asked him, because it's such, like, a hard decision to make, and it ended up working out really well for us. But uh, I'm on the record secondly, at the time listen, saying I love, we should – we shouldn't. I was on the record at the time saying yeah, it was a bad I, idea. I understand both sides of it. I understand why you would say we shouldn't. But uh, secondly, listen, I love Alex Smith. I think he has done a lot for – well, before I even get into that, listen, if – okay, imagine Deshaun Watson or Dak Prescott. If they continue to make the playoffs like four or five years in a row and maybe win one game a season in the playoffs, maybe some games at zero um, – like I would, I would throw. This might be unpopular, but I, I would like the way that like I would scheme them and understand them would be like in the same group as Alex Smith as a quarterback. And like when you evaluate him from a losing, uh, like a, uh, we lost a two or three losing season. One was like two and fourteen. But so when we started winning with Alex Smith, we became like comfortable as a fan base watching like teams win, and then you want to go another level and i think that's where uh people started to um, get after alex smith is he wasn't quite that quarterback that was going to absolutely win a fourth quarter drive for your team you know what i'm saying like yeah yeah, no does that make sense like can uh, i let me i think hold on one second one second and then uh and i think if if deshaun or like dak for example don't progress in that manner as well i think their fan bases are going to feel really torn about them as well as players and then i don't think alex smith deserves a super bowl ring like i fucking love him but i think you i love you but i think you're crazy all right man if i leave my job and a year later all my homies get it get a bonus do i get the goddamn bonus as well even though i've been gone for a year but what <laughs> even if you, fucking, client, you get the I mean, bonus based I mean, on the client you secured and you were the one i mean it, like it doesn't business. matter you're the one that got the business, business in the first place you, you can lay the groundwork but you're you're not there anymore you know you get business oh. you secure the business you get commission that's all i'm saying yeah he, until you leave he, the company he, you're, you're nothing to them at that point i'm not saying he's not the chiefs but you're you're 110 percent right. I won't I won't like disagree with that because like I said, I'm not a big person about your emotions are in, in I understand where you're coming from. I'm not I'm not a big person about like this is not me. This is not me. Like uh, I'm not the type of person let's let's hand out a Super Bowl ring. But uh, watching 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 this this documentary. I mean, even even Pat Mahomes. He, he said it in a, in a Super Bowl interview that he accredits a lot of what he what he has learned to Alex Smith. And, and I'm not a like I said, I'm not a big person on, on I would never give a Super Bowl ring out that you're 110 percent. Right. But here's the thing. Pat Mahomes came in. He was a gunslinger. That that was really what he. I get. I get it. He helped develop yeah. Mahomes' game, but that doesn't mean you deserve a Super Bowl ring for okay. it. Okay. All right. Well, no, just, no, just, no, just, no, no. just I'm going to put a nail on it here because we've been going on this for a little while. What I think we're trying to say is that I don't think we are in the position we are now to have won a Super Bowl, have gone to two consecutive AFC championships, and be poised to potentially repeat as as Super Bowl champions next year, were it not for the culture and the impact that Alex Smith had on Patrick Mahomes' development, on the development of the offense, and on the culture of the team. I think that that was where he was so instrumental. So, just to put a pin on the Alex Smith topic. Wait, question. I have I one question. What, I think that's I think maybe saying a Super Bowl <laughs> ring 
is too much. But I think he deserves more credit than he gets for how important he was and how much of an impact he still has on this team as it's presently constructed. Okay, that's fair. Moving on. <laughs> no, no, no. Let, let me get. Let me God. get. Damn it. <laughs> Let me get this already man in real quick. The the reason why I think that uh, Alex Smith deserves a Super Bowl ring is because it'd be one thing if the Chiefs had um, had quarterbacks that were successful to 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 get them there, but we have not. Outside of Trent Green, like you talked about Trent Green, you talked about uh, Joe Montana. Outside of those two players, which which we got those guys on their the end of their career. Um, the Chiefs, that was their biggest flaw, was was that we could not figure out the quarterback position. So now that you have a quarterback that is willing to um, – Trent Green and Joe Montana, they Montana. did not, they did not uh, develop – help develop a quarterback like Mahomes uh, to be the quarterback that they are now. So yeah, that, that's Green. the reason why I want to give – that's the reason why I would allude to um, giving Alex Smith a, a ring is because let, let's look at his – let's look at his whole body of work. I mean, like I said, he can, came can we in – just not and, dive back into it, Mike? I love you, brother. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to transition to the last dance because uh, I think we could talk – Because I know you're dying to talk about that, Mike. I've seen your I'm, Twitter feed, and you are about to go on a rampage on the last no, dance. I'm not, a, I'm not even – like, I'm not even as much of an Alex Smith fan as Tommy is. You know, <laughs> Tommy, I, I, Tommy, I know you're a big – I know you're a big Alex Smith fan, and I am too, but, like, I'm not – I'm not uh, I'm not that deep, but anyways, we can you know, move we, on. We talked about doing the drunk but, episode. I think Smitty jumped the gun on that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the last dance, man. Okay, the last two episodes uh, this week were episodes four or five and six, so there's four more left, and uh, I'm starting to get interested in how much they're gonna be able to fit into these last four because they're still only on ninety two, ninety three. And yeah. what's going to happen next week, it's going to be Jordan leaving the game. It's going to be the murder of his father. It's going to be all these things that happen in between 93, 94, 95. So I'm re- it's going to be a wild ride. I think the next two weeks are going to be some incredible episodes. But Last Dance, episode five. Um, one, episode five was um, in tribute to the late Kobe Bean Bryant. One of the greatest of all time. Probably the closest comparison to MJ of anybody else in the history of the league. Um, and they had a very fitting, I think, tribute to Kobe and an emotional comparison to Michael and Kobe's game. And I thought it was interesting. They introed it kind of showing the um, the All-Star game that season in, in 1998. Kobe in his second year in the league, um, and then Kobe talking and sharing some sentiments about Michael, and, you know, Kobe started to talk about, you know, people say all these comparisons on one-on-one, you know, Kobe would take Michael, like, no chance, like, no chance Michael could beat Kobe, and Kobe was like, hold up, wait a minute, you have to understand, without Michael Jordan, there is no Kobe Bryant, there is no, the type of, the way he played, he literally modeled his game after him. And I know we've talked on the podcast before, but just, you know, quickly, I wanted to talk about that was a very, um, and maybe it was the, always the original intent to include that in the documentary. But I thought, especially considering how re, how close we are to the passing of Kobe Bryant, I thought it was a really special tribute to him to, number one, dedicate the episode to him, and two, kind of talk about that relationship a little bit. Um, I thought that was really special. I don't know what you, what your thoughts were on that. Mike. Yeah, no, I thought it was I, I thought the timing was perfect because, um, you know, they had just passed. It was almost a what a year um, since they passed uh, when this when this episode was released um, or no, not a year. But uh, Gigi would have been what, 14, 14. Last so, week, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it came a out. Uh, it's been it came out. two months. <laughs> Yeah, it came out perfectly. This coronavirus lockdown's messing with you, brother. 
<laughs> my name is margaritas um no i thought that like you know i thought this the, the timing was perfect um just because it was Gigi's birthday like what two or three days before this uh, episode release um but it was interesting to see right off the bat um madison square garden which is like michael's like favorite place to play um, and then you've got 18 year old, 19 year old uh, Kobe Bryant that is playing, and in this in his first All Star game, and you 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 take a look into the locker room of how Michael Jordan was going to attack uh, Kobe Bryant because nowadays the the All Star games it's it's all fun and games you know it it really is all fun and games but back then it was kind of a competition and wow. you you hear michael jordan say the little laker boy that's gonna take everybody one-on-one um so they knew what kobe was wanting to do uh for this for this all-star game and michael jordan as they as they called to it was was still the king at the time and i, I and i think that michael jordan was not ready to give up his um uh, his reign you know, but uh, I think you see a little bit with the interview with Kobe. That, and I wish that there was more interviews with Kobe. And it was very slight, but Kobe was, Kobe was like, look, I was 18 at the time. You know, I was, I was airballing everything. Um, and I just asked Michael Jordan about a about a jump shot. You know, the same jump shot that that Michael perfected, and Michael was was the type of competitor and, and I'm kind of like this with my friends that I play golf with. I'm the type type of competitor in golf and that I want to beat you, but I want to beat you at your best. I want, I want you to, I want to see you succeed. And Jordan was about that. Jordan, Jordan was like, look, I'll tell you how to be successful but you're not going to be more successful with me. And I think that that showed because Kobe made it a point to um, guard him one-on-one for that all-star game. And (laughs) Jordan won the MVP. Jordan made it a point. Jordan made it a point that, Hey, Jordan, Michael Jordan knew that Kobe was going to want to guard him. And Jordan said, okay, I'll take your best. And yeah. I'm going to prove you. I'm, I'm going to tell you why I'm the king of the sport. And then I'm going to give you I'm going to give you, you know, pointers of how to be successful like me. Yeah. And it, OK, so a couple of things. One, I, I don't think that the all star game today is all fun and games. I just want to say that. Get that out there for the listeners. It is. Of, it is. It no, is. Come on. You, you saw this. Last you've got year. rappers. You've got you've got J. Cole. You've got fucking Kendrick Lamar that want to play in the dude, fucking was, All-Star, that's a game. All-Star game. They laugh. It is. <laughs> Come on, a celebrity How All-Star you, game, dude. It's a different game, dude. You don't even know what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. Moving compare? on. Moving on. How I'm just gonna say, compare? dude. This this compare. last year's All-Star game was insane. Anyways, the next point. Um. I think what was also special, and you kind of talked about it, Mike, is that, like, Michael reached <clears> out <throat> to Kobe and said, like, hey, call me anytime. And, like, so Kobe had a direct line to the greatest to ever lace him up and to ask him questions. And that's what you want as a professional in any industry. You want that guy or that girl or whoever it is professionally to say, hey, you know, I know you're going to take a run at me someday. You probably want my job. But, like, I'm going to show you what it takes to be successful in this business or this career or whatever it is. And they, t- you, take, they take you on as, as, like, a mentee, as a mentor-mentee role. And when Michael spoke at Kobe's memorial, he got really emotional and talked about Kobe like he was his little brother. And kind of full circle, you heard Kobe talking about Michael in a documentary last night, literally calling MJ his big brother. He was like, MJ brother. was a big brother to me. And I thought that was a really, really touching moment. But to continue with the Madison Square Garden theme, his final game as a bull in Madison Square Garden, he breaks out the original Air Jordan 1s, the, the ones that he played in back in 1985, and just put on a show. And he's, his feet were bleeding by the end of the game. But he did it just to make that moment special. And I thought it was so interesting. They talk about Michael's relationship with Nike 
and his commitment to the brand and how I didn't really realize until last night how much of an upstart shoe company Nike was at the time. And they talk about in a documentary only expecting a good year that that year for the for the Jordan ones would be six million in sales or six million sold. They sold 128 million in Jordan's rookie season, and he basically put that brand, the one Smitty's rocking on his hat, they, he put Nike on the map. Um, and I think that that's crazy. And one of the things you know people think about Jordan now because he has his own offshoot of the Nike brand, but he created Nike into the multi-billion dollar industry that it is today and he changed sneaker the sneaker game like forever Mm -hmm. so so to talk about that like jordan might have might have done that but it 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 goes more credit deserves to his mom because (laughs) he didn't want to take he didn't he didn't want to take this deal he nike at that time uh one of the greatest books that i've ever read was shoe dog um, that's it, it's a memoir by by Phil Knight, the creator of Nike, and it I cannot recommend a, a book more to the people than than this book. And um, they don't really talk about uh, Jordan um, or or getting into that, but it's more about uh, Phil Knight, the creator of Nike, of how he came to Nike, and. One of the things in that book was that they were we we think Nike Nike today is um, is the perennial all star. I mean, I, I'm I'm wearing Nikes today. I almost bought I, I tried to buy a pair of Jordans, uh, pair of Jordan fives that were released yesterday. <laughs> I, here's the thing: we, I've never we owned a whole podcast on shoes i've never i've never owned a pair of jordans and i'm more of i I wouldn't consider myself a sneakerhead. um i i do like the air maxes um i do rock nike that's that's a big brand loyalty that i have but um in this book was about how nike came to and it's it's a beautiful book like if you are interested in in business then then read this book because it tells you about how Nike came to. Um, like funny. But, but they talk about it in the documentary is that Jordan didn't even want to sign with Nike. They did, he didn't even – he wanted Adidas, Reebok, ran the game in NBA at the time. Um, it was all about Reebok or Adidas. Nike in the 80s was still coming on, and – Nike really hit on them. They spent, they they paid twice as much, uh, as much twice as much as anybody that was getting paid in the game to to rock a shoe shoe label, and they swung and they hit a fucking home run because nowadays Jordan just changed the culture. Um, yeah. Like I said, you know, I wanted to buy uh, some Jordans. I wanted to buy my first pair of Jordans like two days ago and they were, they, they released the the Jordan fives at 9 AM and I was playing golf and I was like, all right, I'm playing golf. Uh, Hey guys, you know, you guys play, I need it. I need to buy these Jordans, these Jordan fives, the, the <laughs> OG retros. Guess what? I got a little bit drunk and come to, come to, come to speak of it. It's an hour past the release, and I'm like, oh, fuck. I need to try to buy these Jordans, and they're gone. They're gone. <laughs> yeah. Jordans, a, you, you cannot get a pair of Jordans time. right now. You can't get a pair of Jordans, especially with this release. You can't get a pair of Jordans uh, Man, this is within me. five minutes. Yeah. And yeah, he, ch- he changed the game. Um, so keep moving I on. I the life. You yeah. golf every damn day. I'm still yeah. showing up to work, going home, tired. You're golfing <laughs> on podcasts. Yeah, Dude, we. It's a hard life for me. <laughs> Dude, I wrote two reports today, and I got two more to write tomorrow. I'm still still doing the damn thing uh, yep. every day at work. But uh, get back into the last dance. So in 92, the Bulls go on to win, win the title. 
and they defeat the Tor- Portland Trail Blazers. And at the end of the 92 season, they essentially transition straight to the Olympics that year in Barcelona. So Michael has like what a two week, like a week, two weeks off before he basically has to report for training camp um, for the Olympics. And you can kind of start to see that Michael is starting to get a little burnout of his own celebrity. Like, sir, you talked about, he was like the most famous person in the world, like the most famous Mm -hmm. person in the world, the most recognizable, like across the world. And I think Barcelona gave him an opportunity to get more exposure, but it also just wore him down even more. He had to answer questions about, you know, Isaiah Thomas not being on the team. And he talks about the documentary You know, he wasn't the only one that wouldn't have gotten along with Isaiah had they played. Like, Scotty had beef with Isaiah. Ewing had beef with Isaiah. Barkley had beef with Isaiah. Like, essentially the entire team had beef with Isaiah, and they get to that a little bit. Um, I mean, like, from an outsider's perspective, sort of, can you understand, like, it would be frustrating for Michael to get blamed for the reason Isaiah didn't make the Dream Team was solely on him. But when there's all these other external factors, like, when they he the guy's essentially viewed as a potential cancer to the team and a, a, a yeah. roadblock to their success like how do you deal with that and then also try and maintain this like public persona that michael was still trying to like achieve at the time yeah it's gotta be mind i mean like i will to begin like isaiah was his own worst enemy um it's kind of funny hopping on Twitter and seeing all the Isaiah Thomases out there like, yo, get out of my DMs. I'm not yeah. Isaiah, Tom- <laughs> Isaiah Thomas you're looking for. But, uh, no, it's weird because, like, I'm sure when he, whenever he goes overseas, he knows that it's going to be, a, like, a lot of fandom. And I feel like mentally, in his mind, it might even be an opportunity to, you know, to get away where people might not recognize you. But it's, like, it's worse when he yeah. gets there. And that, I imagine – could really wear on you mentally um, mm-hmm. cuz you have to put up a persona right you can't i mean you have this public image that you're trying to save and what well, you're trying to simultaneously save it and create it for the public you know you're you have a brand you're making yeah. so much money off likeness it's it's insane um but yeah i mean that dream team i just love looking at that roster cuz i don't fully no, everyone's – I have a good idea of how each player played, and I watch highlights, but, like, the intricacies of how they played, I don't know. So I'm, like, able to fill in those gaps with the imagination in my mind, and I f- just feel like those teams were so stacked. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and Isaiah missed an opportunity to be on the Dream Team, which is like yeah. – I mean, is there a more significant team that we reference in our culture than that team? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but like how Wade wanted to, uh, how D Wade's put out a doc- documentary on the Redeem team, and I don't even remember us calling them the Redeem team. Maybe we did, but like it just feels so played out and lame yeah. compared to the Dream Team. You know, I do. Re- I do remember that because, you know, I follow USA basketball like pretty closely, and I remember the feeling after that 2004 bronze medal performance in Athens. And it just was, like, this complete, like, thrown together, like, just let's put together an all-star team and not think about the cohesive unit that it needs to be. So you got, like, Iverson and Marbury and Lamar Odom and, like, you know, Tim Duncan was the best player on that team, but he's not surrounded with players that complement Tim Duncan necessarily. Yeah, it's a really good point. The collection of talent that they had, I think the only comparable one was that Redeem team where you look at it, you had bloss- blossoming stars like LeBron, Carmelo, Wade. You had guys kind of on the tail short, not tail end because Kobe went to the finals the following year, but kind of on the back end of their career. You know, Kobe was like 31, 32 at the time. Um, and that probably, since the, the Dream Team, we had won gold medal since 92, but there was never one that had that kind of – air about them and the pressure that that 08 team inherited was very similar to the 92 one yeah that's the the 92 team knew that they were going to dominate but they had to go out and and show the world they could do it 2008 
they were going up against a really good Spain team and a really good French team and guys around the world. The game had had, had adapted and they still like the, the 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 final game against Spain was close. But man, that was that that was an incredible team considering what they were up against and, and the way basketball had progressed in the in the last decade and a half. Smitty. Point. Do you, do you, so so I think I think the biggest thing on that uh, on that ninety two dream team is that um, this was the first time that the Olympics was calling on the NBA to hey submit your best players and um, it, it's crazy is that. Here's the thing, like you you watch Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan will sit there and tell you, uh, it, like he did in the documentary, that he does not have anything against Isaiah Thomas's game. But um, the biggest thing with that is that developing that camaraderie, um, yeah. which I, I I think that you really see a lot about that um, in their practices. Imagine Isaiah Thomas. Um, in in the in those practices because it, in the last they sh- they, yeah exactly I mean you have, <laughs> Ma- you have magic you have magic Johnson throwing a fucking ball in the top row of the stands because he was upset because he's losing Michael John or uh, <laughs> Michael Jordan yeah. um, it, it, and then they talk about it, how um, they finished that practice and nobody said a word. And then finally, Magic is like, hey, we shouldn't have pissed them off. That's the type of camaraderie that you want to have. Um, yeah. I don't think that you're going to reciprocate that with Isaiah Thomas on that team. Um, I think the biggest question mark on that is um, whether you bring Isaiah Thomas uh, or uh, uh, John Stockton on the team, which – John Stockton was not nearly the player that he that that Isaiah Thomas was, but he was quote unquote comparable. Yeah. I, I like John Stockton. Um, I think he's great. Uh, I think he's a great um, uh, assist leader. But Isaiah Thomas was more of like let me, let me shoot. And I think Michael Jordan said it perfectly. Is he Michael Jordan said. Uh, the best point guard that he had ever seen was uh, Magic Johnson. And then the next was Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. Um, and, and that's with with respect of uh, Jordan disliking Isaiah Thomas. And, sure. and Jordan said it best. He goes, look, I, can, I might hate Isaiah Thomas. I might hate him. But I can never disrespect his game. And yeah. I think that's where I gain more respect to Michael Jordan is that he might not have liked you, but he's going to understand where you are as a player. And I think they talk a little bit about that with Clyde Drexler um, when, um, when they're going against Portland in 92, you know, uh, Jordan knew that Drexler was, was a good player, but he was playing cards with magic Johnson. And he told magic Johnson, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to school this dude. And he fucking did. Yeah. 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 I mean, did Michael. You, did you know, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, sorry. You got Michael. it. It's going to be a little. I, I was. I just got to thinking, uh, you know, John Stockton's son played at Gonzaga like two years ago, I think. Yeah. Yep. And he yep. played. He played the type of basketball you would exactly expect him to play. <laughs> just like yeah, chucking short, deep short. threes like a. Uh, and just like a finesse dribbler. Get into the little crevices and cracks beneath the Man. big guys. Dude, the, the Stockton shorts are making a comeback, dude. You see them, all the players now, they want to wear their shorts dude, shorter. Tommy, dude, I, I could like talk it. all day about how 80s fa- 80s and 90s fashion is becoming trendy now. Dude, it's on a and it has way. been the last four or five years. Yeah, yeah, I, I love say, it. That's, it that's is remarkable, that's, and I love every second of it. Yeah. I, I love uh, what life is for. right now. I mean, 90s. Well, I mean, that's, that's the nature of, of you know our society and our culture. I think most cultures is that Sick it's kind of in the loop. Yeah. Um, but, man, early 2000s culture is so goddamn ugly, I don't think it's ever coming back around. Um, I, I fucking hope not because, dude, the shit, people, were wearing, hair, people were wearing, the, like, 2002. Oh, my God. Like, you look yeah. back at, like, <laughs> Justin Timberlake in the all-denim outfit with, like, the frosted curly tips. I mean, dude, I hope yeah. that shit never comes uh, back. 
I agree. But to get us back on track, I have a question for you guys. So it's one that I I deal with a lot in soccer. Well, one that I think about quite a bit is um, so our basketball in our country when it comes to like World Cups, we're the superior team. Uh, do you ever see a future in which that becomes more balanced or there's um, – just because like when I, when I think about it and I follow NBA loosely compared to you guys, there seems to be quite a few foreign players. Um, yeah. But, I, think, I mean, I th- the I level think, we're producing them. Yeah, I go think ahead. to what you – to that point, you know, like I kind of live, sleep, eat, and drink basketball, and I have – like watch the international game, like the FIBA, like world championships. And even Uh when it's not the Olympics, I try and follow it as closely as possible. And the world is catching up, but I still think that the United States is a hotbed and will always, at least for the next two, three decades, be the superior power when it comes to international play for the Is sport. it socioeconomic? Because, is that yeah, well because it's so integral to the, like the like the country and yeah. level of competition you'll get at the amateur level is yep. comparable yeah. to that of the pro level overseas. So yeah. you see these college kids, you know, the U eighteen, the U nineteen teams, like are dominating teams around the world. Oh I just thought of a good guess we could have, Tommy. Sorry to cut you off. I thought – so we have a friend, Garrett Stutz, who's playing in Japan right now. Well, not right now, but before all this began, he would be a great person to try and get on here to Let's talk to Let's talk, get him on. Let's get him on. Yes, Mike. Sorry. No, I think uh, to your point is um, I think that American basketball has elevated the game uh, Europeanly, um, and I think that it goes to the China leagues. Uh, you talk about Garrett Stutz, our, our good friend that played at, at Wichita State, um, that was with him during the final four years at Wichita State. Um, I don't think he was. I think he graduated the year before. He was. Yeah, he was. He, he, yeah. Garrett Stutz graduated with me. You know, we had a good relationship, and and we still talk to this day. Um, I think let's focus more on on. And I think that's what the documentary gets on is how USA basketball influenced the world. You, you talk about Tony Kukoc uh, in Croatia. Um, the the NBA when when the, when they did the '92 Dream Team, they influenced um, they influenced the world um, yeah. to become better. Uh, Sore, you can probably speak more than this than I can, but um, is it's it's like soccer in U- United States. We see European leagues. We see uh, you know the these leagues, the the Italian leagues that that influence players in another country. Um, I think that Michael Jordan, the Dream Team, influenced basketball uh, globally Absolutely. at that point. Um, yeah, and it, I think I think it, we all we can all agree that that '92 Dream Team had a huge impact on the globalization of the sport. I don't think anyone denies that. Um, but I do right. think it's going to be a while to sort to your question, just kind of put a, a a period on it. Is that it's going to be a while before the world catches up? I think probably the biggest threats to the United States dominance are countries like Spain, um, that European countries, European countries with a di- with a diverse I would a, say diverse, with, a, with a diverse population. I think it's going to be European countries with a more diverse population um, because mm. um, that is what makes basketball, I think, special is that you have guys from kind of different backgrounds, affluent backgrounds, you know, yeah, for, uh, yeah. underserved backgrounds, um, that kind of a lot of, immigrants. Of, the, of those two. Yeah, it's, it is really a melting pot. I know people like to think of the NBA – um, as you know, like culturally, mainly being, you know, like poor African American kids, but that's really, if you look at the the backgrounds of a lot of these kids, that's that's not the case anymore. Um, and I think it really has become more of a global melting pot, whether it's Giannis or Luca or Porzingis or all these guys from all over the world. 
Um, it's really becoming a global game, and I'm excited to see where that goes. But yeah, I think Mike, it goes without saying that that 92 Dream Team is a big reason for it. So let's. Uh, Mike, did you say you think Japan would be the team, the country? Did you China, say Japan? China. China. Oh, China. Yeah, and, China. And, okay. and, 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 and basketball is huge over there. But let's. Uh, yeah. Right. In the interest of time, let's uh, let's kind of speed through so it's, uh, episode six. Uh, and, 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 and so we kind of talked about this. Um, what it's like to be Michael and living under that microscope. And that's really what episode six talked about. I, we don't have to get into all the specifics, but Michael was essentially limited to, he had his time on the court, his meetings and practices with his team, golf, and the rest of the time was occupied probably with promotional tours, with his security, basically being isolated. Um, you know, people talk about Michael, you know, I've heard from people that, that knew that, that, that played basketball with Jordan's kids at Loyola, Chicago, at Loyola in Chicago, the high school, and that Michael, you know, wasn't always present, you know, in his kids' lives or his family. And I think probably because he just didn't have time for anything else. Um, I think it, pro- my, episode six, and I, I do want to make this short because we got a little bit, we got limited time, so I don't want to go too long on that, but you really see Michael starting to tire of the game of basketball and not necessarily the game of basketball, but all the things that come with being as successful and as popular and as immortalized as Jordan was. Because anytime you reach that pre- that, 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 that top of the mountain, people want to bring you down. And you started to see that, the reports, the books that were written about Michael's competitiveness, not necessarily always being directed in a positive way. You see... Um, people speculating about his gambling habits and how he conducts himself off the court um, in his free time. And I think Michael felt so insulated inside this bubble that he was starting to grow tired, tired of the game. And obviously it has its you know, conclusion, which ends in, in his premature retirement after the 93 season. Um, and that's really what episode six was about. And I found it difficult to watch at times because it really is tragic when you think about the life that Michael's had to live um, or had to live at a time where you, everyone sees you as this person, this godlike figure. Holier you than that. You don't, yeah, you, that. you don't. At that point, you don't really know who you can trust, okay. who you can confide in, and then the yeah. book comes out that it, that divulges all these yeah. secrets, and that's got to be really difficult for an athlete at that at that point in his career. So yeah. I want to know what your guys' thoughts on were. It's it's just, like just they on, say. Sorry. Just, just like the they say. Theme, it, <laughs> oh god uh, i need to work on that tommy i cut you i literally thought you were about to end your sentence no go ahead go ahead uh, but the words were jumping out of my tongue i'll work on that we got time uh me and you buddy uh and you mike uh no so it's it's like the saying the loneliest of people are the kings are the loneliest of people um and partially because who do you trust who's who i mean you understand i don't need to explain it but yeah. go ahead mike <laughs> <laughs> no, I butchered the hell out of that. I chime in was, you know, here's the deal. Um, we've all played sports, and I think that people that listen to this podcast, they played sports. Uh, you want to, you want to go to the highest of high. Um, when you reach that high, you think it's all, you think it's all glory, you think it's all glam, uh, but. But at the end of the day, um, Michael Jordan was confined to staying in a hotel room, and, and that was it. You know that that's got to be really tough. You know when when you, you when you stay in a hotel room, you're smoking cigars in the '90s, which I thought was hilarious. Like I could not imagine smoking a cigar in a hotel room right now. But when he when he Special leaves up. that he, when Michael Jordan said it best is that he's got a little bit of peace and quiet in, in his hotel room, whether, whether he's in Chicago, whether he's in Atlanta or whether he's playing the finals in New York, but imagine how that would be. I mean, imagine where you cannot step outside and, and and be not be swarmed by um, fans, by media, by by anything. I mean, uh, we're in a crisis right now, and it, with with coronavirus, where we're confined to one space. Well, Michael Jordan lived that life, but that 
he had to exit that space and go out and, and he swarmed. I mean, you you saw it in the in the the documentary where he was just completely swarmed. Um, that's I think is the price that you pay for greatness. Yeah. Michael Jordan wanted nothing to be great, and I think that he he knew, but he did not fully understand of that's the price you pay for being the best. Um, you know. It'd be one thing if if you're if you're Scottie Pippen. It'd be one thing if you're fucking um, uh, Magic Johnson or whatever. But you're Michael Jordan. Everybody wants to be you. Everybody yeah. wants to see you, and everybody wants to be around you. Where to the point where you cannot, you can't go out and grab lunch. You can't, you can't yeah, do the things that we. That we're that yeah you, you can't do the things that we we're talking about coronavirus right granted. now yeah yeah exactly hey I got like, a I mean, hypothetical for you if you could have a million dollars a year but every time you leave your house it's like living Jordan's life would you do it in the nineties no and I think I think that you I think they dive deep into that and episode <laughs> six is it, I do it hell yeah bro no, I think. I think that you dive deeper into that is is yes I'm Michael Jordan I'm the greatest player ever but you don't want the fame you don't want the fame yeah. but at the same I, I think, time you have to climb that mountain to be the best yeah. like to be the best you have to understand that this is what's going to come and yeah. I and I think, I think that's we'll what see. happens to athletes nowadays is that they don't understand that if I am Pat Mahomes, if I am you know the greatest player in in my division or or my, or my don't sport get nowadays, Mike, you can't you can't go out, you can't do anything. Yeah, and I think I think we'll see, and that's what I'm excited for. Just to kind of close out the conversation on the last dance. That's what I'm excited for in episode seven is to see Michael say, okay, you're not going to give me the privacy. You're not going to give me the leeway that I feel like I've earned. I'm just going to leave and I'm going to go play baseball and I'm going to just be one of the guys again. I'm going to ride the bus in the minors. I'm going to, you know, carry, you know, isn't that part of the fun, the you know, I'm going to carry Sports. the bat. The, I'm going to carry the bats and I'm going to do all the things that, you know, I never had to do as an athlete. I'm going to chase the dream that my dad had for me. Um, I'm excited to see see that side of Michael and him maybe try and pursue some level of normalcy and some level of, you know, see what it's like on the other side of the coin. See what it's like to be on the bench. See what it's like to yep. to be the not the guy. And I think Michael maybe craved that. And I think people look at, his time with the White Sox organization and him leaving basketball to play baseball is him being selfish and him, you know, not being committed to the Bulls. But I think in order to him, him for him to achieve what he did at the end of his career with Chicago with three more championships, he needed that break. Just like Rodman needed the trip to Vegas. You got to focus on your own happiness. Jordan you know? needed Jordan needed that that 16 month sabbatical to find his love for the sport again and be able to to go back into being under the spotlight, under, under the magnifying glass again. Did, uh, did Michael have a gambling problem? Do you think? I don't, I mean, I, 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 deal. I watched, I, I watched him play golf. I watched him play golf, you know, and, and I, and I watch him like, I, I play 95, like nineties golf and, and I'm watching Jordan play golf and he's pissed off. He he is not a good golfer at any means at at the time during this during this documentary. Do you think that he had a gambling problem? I do. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna I wanna did, get back did to Did he have a gambling problem? It, like, I don't, here's, I don't here's, speak on that. I don't no, think no, I, no, no, I think no. Just, let me I don't let me talk real quick. Smitty. I don't wanna you asked the question, so I'm gonna answer it. I don't wanna get too tangential here because we gotta wrap it up soon. But what I will say is I think that for any average person 
the amounts that he was betting and the frequency that he was betting, you would say that, yeah, that's a gambling problem. Yeah, but, I think, I think, gambling. but I think I believe Michael when he says, I don't have a gambling problem. I have a competition problem. I can quit gambling whenever I want. What I can't quit is making things about me beating you, me taking something from you, whether that's your pride, whether that's your dignity, or whether that's the $20 bill in your pocket. I think that's what is, Michael was addicted to. Is that to. both? Listen, is uh, that no, both? no, no, no. And I think, I don't think if Michael or is had that both? Home, Smitty, wait. If Michael had a gambling problem, he wouldn't own a majority stake in a billion-dollar organization. So you're talking like, about money, guys. When Michael, when you're he talking about money, friend, you're not talking I mean, about like, gambling. Like if I had a uh, if I had a million dollars to gamble, you're you're upset. At, like we're talking about like gambling at one hundred twenty thousand dollars. If I have a a million dollars and I and I gamble uh, uh one point two five million dollars, that's not a gambling problem it's, it's uh, to anybody. If I have that amount of money, right. I, I think you're arguing against. That's a, it's against, a gambling problem. Wait, that's a gambling just problem. Just explain that it wasn't a gambling problem. Yeah, you just explained it wasn't. All it, right, it's, moving. No, it's a gambling hey, can problem. I, can I get back to Tommy's original point before I lose the train of thought? Yeah, uh, for it. Listen, so I think like a part of what makes sports fun is that grind and that camaraderie. So yeah, I, I like absolutely don't blame Jordan and going to baseball. Um, and you, like I mentioned earlier, but you implied is you have to find your own happiness in life. I mean, I think if you boil a lot of situations down to that simple statement, then I think a lot of actions can be explained for it. And I think that does a good job of explaining Jordan's. And can we agree that Tim Tebow isn't all that bad of a guy for switching over to baseball, baby? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we agree. <laughs> Tim Tebow is a pretty good dude. No, or on, that mean, point, on that point, of, I'm, sorry, of I'm sorry. We're talking. Oh, hold on, real quickly. We're talking about gambling. We're talking about a professional <laughs> player gambling 1.2 million dollars over golf. You're talking about it. Sorry, yeah, you're talking guys. about. It. We're not that's, talking about. Well, it. You're talking about. We watch. It. We watch the what, documentary. What is the we point watch. You're getting that. I don't let understand. Let me talk. Let me talk. We watch, watch this. We watch this documentary, and I'm watching Jordan miss like six foot putts. Guess what? I can make those six foot putts. Okay. I'm not gambling. One point two million dollars on okay. that. Okay, point made. Are Smitty you, thinks that Michael had me? a gambling problem, and we, I don't yeah. agree. Anyways, come on. So, I know, and come I'm, on. I'm his dad, I don't know. His dad, his dad died. His dad not, died. Because of his gambling we're not, problem. We're not getting into his the conspiracy. His dad died. We're Shut getting, up. That is such a conspiracy. Oh, okay. my but sorry, God. I'm going to bring it. I'm going to bring it. Is that because of his okay. gambling we're problem? we got to get order here. we got to get order here. Okay, I'm going to bring it to a point. Okay. <laughs> we're, Wait, we're, isn't we're, that why he left basketball, though? Not because... He, because he was tired of it, he just got caught gambling. Are, are you speculation? Me? Come That's on, speculation. guys. Like, we we'll talk about that next time. We'll just talk kidding. about it. Next week. Dad, hour five. Hour five. So, so, Sawyer, his to your point, dad happiness, died. Finding happiness is important, and you got to do what makes you happy. And I'm going to tell yeah, you, as the, newest, as, as the newest resident of 5207 Juniper Drive, that is a common theme at that house. About finding hey, happiness, find you know what makes who, you happy. You know who Who's reminded that? me of that here, here, in like a here. weird time, not a bad time, just a weird situation in my life. Joe remind Joe Prello, shout out, reminded me of that, and I was like, God, yeah, of course, that it's so simple. Can you, stop, sense. can you stop doing that? What? That you you're giving shout outs to people that nobody knows. Yeah, but okay. our listeners know I'm them. Just one our person. 30, our 35 listeners, probably most of them know who Joe is. Listen, shout out if Lou, I give someone shout a shout out, out that's okay, not all that bad of a thing, man. We, we're allowed uh, to give people shout Joe. outs. All right, shout I'm not over here doing it left and right, screaming, hey, you get a shout out, you get a shout out, you get a shout out. By the yeah. way, fuck Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> Oprah. Okay, I could so let's get... go on about that, too. Yeah, so... Uh, to finish off the episode, because I think we got a little off the rails here tonight, um, let's go with the pick three uh, in uh, honor of Cinco de Mayo, which is, for those of you listening, uh, on Tuesday morning, that is today. I uh, prematurely celebrated Cinco de Mayo with a nice 
uh, enchilada dinner that my aunt prepared enchiladas and brought them over to the house yesterday. We put them in the oven, fired them up. They were excellent. For those of you that don't know, my uh, my dad's side of the family. We delicioso. Yeah, yeah. For those of you who don't know that, my, my dad's side of the family is Mexican, so a lot of good Mexican food on uh, my dad's side of the family, so his sister brought those over. And uh, Mike prematurely celebrated Cinco de Mayo by getting – Shit rocked off of margaritas <laughs> yeah, before well, the podcast. I, here, here's the deal. Like, if you guys are listening to this fucking podcast, I'm fucking drunk. I think um, I think we're we're an hour and five minutes into the podcast. I think they figured that out about minute six. <laughs> so I, anyway. I knew it as soon as I looked at Mike on yeah. the Zoom call. Yeah. We see so his let's, eyes. Uh, I, let's pick our uh, <laughs> let's pick our top three Mexican <laughs> restaurants. Um, I'll go first because I don't think I've gone first yet on the pick three. No. So I'm going to go a little off the list. All right. Um, my top three, um, Brookside Barrio. Um, that's on the list, Brookside hey, Barrio. Yeah. It's in my own backyard. Um, Can't uh, wait to try they're, it. They're my cousin owns that place. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. number two, I would go with uh, Mission Taco. It originated in St. Louis, but they've got it one did. here in, in, did, Kansas, yeah. in Kansas City now. Fuck and St. I Louis, dude. And I, I fucking hate St. Louis. Get right. the fuck out of your St. So Louis Mission, bullshit. Mission Taco, and then finally, my last one is the one that I had most recently last week. I think some of the best authentic Mexican in the city, Teo Cali, down near uh, Crown Center. Kind of over by Hospital Hill, Tail Cali. Shout out! Their entrees are fire. What's it called? There's Tail Cali, T E O C A L I. Excellent Mexican food, authentic, not Tex Mex. It's like real deal. Stuff. Is that Uncle so, Cali? Really? Is that what the name of it means? Or no, T O T O Uncle Tail oh. like T E O. Well, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, so I'll go. Bar, uh, yeah, so Barrio, Mission Taco, Teo Cali. Okay. I'm excited to try that Barrio one. Uh, my, in not really any particular order, I don't eat a ton of Mexican food, but there's a place called Champion. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was called, what, whatever. It's called Champion Burritos to Go, and it's in North Kansas City. And I get the Especial Numero Uno. And, uh, Numero Uno. They just they just make like a fucking mean grilled burrito with like Mexican rice. It's pretty good. And then uh, either Torchies or Fuego, which I had um, down in Texas. But I'm sure they have. I'm they're like a national chain. Dude, I've, sure I've heard my uh, two of my best friends from college. Shout out Matt and Will if they listen. Uh, they the live in to tear you down. They live in, they, they live in Dallas and Denton. Which is near Dallas, and they both uh-huh. talk, talk about torchies. So yeah. yeah, I've heard it's really, really good. Yeah, All it's right. tasty. All right, Big Mike. They're kind of like Mission Mission Taco, but more of like a uh, like the tacos are similar, but they're not a sit down, not quite. They're like a fast casual, if you will. Yeah, you know what's uh, good? Um, so the owners of Summit Grill, so like Drew Locke's parents. Oh God, up, I love Summit Grill. Yeah, they <laughs> opened up a Mexican place called South of Summit right next to it. It's pretty good. I think they got a little work to do on, like, the staff there. I think that, uh, like, the overall experience isn't great, but the food's really, really good. Tommy, when I got the job for Mizzou's Alumni Association, uh, my boss wanted to wanted me to meet Drew Locke's dad right away. Really? I mean, (laughs) it it all fell through, but yeah. And guess Um, who I saw last time I ate there? Drew Locke was there having dinner with his brother. Oh, nice. Yeah, Uh, I wanted to go up to him and be like, Division champs, bitch. <laughs> and then uh, my last, I mean last, it's probably not a restaurant, but I really like margarita salsa in a jar that you can buy yeah. at the grocery store. It's good. Yeah. All right, Smitty, you're three. Make it quick. Make it quick, brother. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to go white as fuck. And uh, my first uh, Mexican restaurant is Rancho Grande. <laughs> Because I love queso dip. Because you're a basic B word. You're a fucking gringo, bro. Yeah, what 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 all of you guys said, you fucking pricks. Um, and then I'm gonna go with uh, Port Fonda. I love Port Fonda down in Westport. 
Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I like Port Fonda too, but Port Fonda for me is just a little bit pricey. The fuck off. Um, <laughs> and then my my. Were you Canadian now? You moved yeah, to Minnesota you and you acquired. Uh, my uh, my last is uh, Brookside Barrio because my cousin owns it. Um, I have been drinking margaritas like since like two o'clock because of him. Nice. So uh, yeah, uh, I need to go Brookside Barrio because Brookside has. Um, it's it's not about the food, but the margaritas are fucking prime. Yeah, great patio space too. Great place for a date. I have taken a date Listen, there before. You, I, I date I'm spot. a believer that you can't rate a Mexican restaurant based on the margaritas and not the food. I'm just gonna tell you that right now. That's well, you're a fucking shut that's up. A, that's a bit <laughs> redundant. It's almost like when you. Rated Artego Pizza based on the paintings on the fucking wall. Yeah, and called it Artego. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 okay, all right. Well, uh, last time I checked, neither of you two have had it, so suck a fucking dick. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. That that is the podcast. Have it, week. have it. it, it get. I, I cannot wait till you guys <laughs> fucking munch your fucking mouse on that pizza, and you're like, oh my god, Mike. Smith was right. I will never eat there in my entire life just to prove the point. Never. Eat a fucking dick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Smitty, you have a great, great evening. Enjoy the rest of your margaritas. Sawyer, Mike, pleasure as always. Smitty, you've been muted. Uh, love you guys. Have a great <laughs> rest of your week, listeners. Rate, subscribe, give us a review. We love you guys. Stay healthy. Stay safe out there. And we'll see you guys next week. Come at you live. Peace and love, homies.